Welcome everyone. It's time for Writer's Corner live show. You probably have your favorite book, either fiction or non-fiction. And no matter what the genre, we introduce you to authors from all around the globe so that you know what's available. But more importantly, you get to hear the story behind the story and why you need to go out and buy this book and know what's available. You also get the opportunity to ask our authors questions, which you generally would not have the opportunity to do um, otherwise. And today our guest is none other than Dr. Anthony Turton. Dr. Turton is a political scientist with 24 years of strategic level experiences. He specializes in transboundary water resource management and is widely published. He's got a strong focus on water and the mining industry and in particular has extensive experience in strategic planning and thought leadership in certain in situations of inherent uncertainty. Dr. Turton has an ability to reduce risk by developing accurate strategic level forecasting and to guide decision making under conditions of uncertainty. And more recently, Dr. Turton has adopted Water Shortage South Africa as his charity of choice. And he spearheads a project called Water Lions, which we'll ask him about briefly in the end. But today, our focus is on Dr. Turton as, a, as an author. And the book we're going to focus on today is this one, and it's called Shaking Hands with Billy. Anthony, welcome. Great to have you here today. Uh, thanks, Brigitte. It's uh, a pleasure to talk to you about these matters. Anthony, I want to ask you, I had a look at this book. I've read the book, and I'm fascinated by the way in which you have written this book. You record details of incidents um, so finely that it's it's amazing. I mean, it's 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 a, it, you cover a huge period of time in your life. It's not a short space. I mean, you you go from almost when you were a child right up into fairly recently still. Did you have notebooks for you to to chronicle these events in such detail? Um, because you you. you it's not just the events, but it's the timestamps at which they happen. Did you have tons of post-it notes and, and, and little uh, journals that you were drawing on when you wrote this book? Brigetti, uh, the short answer is no. Um, I have got a, a photographic memory, or I have had uh, my memory starting to fade a bit now, but I, I generally had a photographic memory, and uh, I can recall enormous detail. It's one of the skills that I have. Um, and I happen to be born in very interesting times. You know, I, I write in the book that my my character was formed on the anvil of Africa by the hammer of endemic violence. So I was born literally into the armed struggle and into the wars of liberation. And I grew up into these things and I became a participant as a soldier, ultimately as a special operations intelligence officer, and then as a peacemaker in that process. So I've always felt that I, I had a kind of... Um, uh, privileged view into these things, and uh, I just thought that uh, it would be interesting uh, to hold myself accountable to my family, because that was the purpose of the book in the first place, and uh, where I had to timestamp some of these things, I, when I was writing it, I would reference back to specific events, like, for example, the fall of Nikolai Ceausescu in, uh, in Romania, that was a very specific moment in time, so I just cross-checked some of those dates, but no, I never kept any notes, they were all in my head, and I'd set to download my hard drive because uh, as I've got older now, my hard drive has become pretty crammed and it's, uh, I need more space. So I have to free up space. That is phenomenal. I don't know of many people that could hold all that information in your head. Was it a, a sort of a therapy for you to be able to pin all this down? Was, was it therapeutic for you? Yes, yeah, so at the time that it came out, one needs to appreciate uh, the historic context. Uh, that was the end of the armed struggle and um, the forces or the side that I fought on as a soldier were generally vilified as being the evil people. So we were in many ways like the, like the American Vietnam vets that came back after fighting an unpopular war that weren't well received at home. And at that point in time, there was a, 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 truth and a reconciliation commission underway. And in particular, there were people that were coming forward and applying for amnesty because they'd committed crimes. And they wanted the amnesty, and uh, it was in this context that my daughter got to hear of a of a of a certain individual 
uh, who was in a special operations unit. And he was applying for amnesty, and my daughter suddenly put two and two together, and she thought that if uh, I was also in special operations, and she thought, therefore, I might be one of these war criminals. So it was in that context, which is quite a horrifying thing, that I decided uh, to hold myself accountable to my family. I didn't have to apply for amnesty because I never ever committed any crimes in my in my uh, uh, professional career. But uh, and nonetheless, I just felt that it was good to hold myself accountable. And at the same time, this burden, this terrible burden uh, of uh, carrying all of this information in my head and also waiting one day for someone to tap me on my shoulder and say, aha, I know you where you were at some point in time. I, I wanted to avoid that. You know, so I just came clean and I just I just wrote the story down to my family initially. It was never intended to be published. So your 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 motive initially was basically to write this mem as a memoir to your family. Is that correct? Yes, I initially wrote eight uh, eight copies, and they were leather bound because I came from a from a, a, a highly classified operational environment. I carried a top secret security clearance, so I treated it as a secret document, and I numbered each one. You know, number one of eight, number two of eight, number three of eight, with a distribution list on the bottom of the document. So uh, I gave uh, my daughter copy number one of number eight uh, uh, for her twenty first birthday. And I gave my son number two and my, and my brother and my sister and my, my mother and all the people that I cared about. And copy eight went to my lawyer uh, just in case there was some pushback of this because I must appreciate that I was dealing with some top secret issues that had not been officially declassified. So I was anticipating that maybe someone will come and lock me up for, you know, for talking about classified matters. But at that time, I felt that the war was over and uh, you know we were now trying to rebuild a nation. We were trying to rebuild uh, New South Africa. And all of these matters were part of our historic journey to get to that point. So uh, I always felt that I would hold myself accountable uh, in writing the book, just as I've always held myself accountable as a soldier, as an intelligence officer, as a scientist. And that's what I, that's just what I do you know, as, as a person. So, so that, that is the background. So now you've written a couple of, of or the, the book is a, is a collection of short stories. Um, and, and there's, a couple is Antilles and Airfields, Misfire, Geneva Convention Interlude, um, Interlocking Arcs of Fire, Thousand Yard Store, Caramel and Red Eyes, Crimson Circles in the White Sand, um, Heart Minds and Mutiny, Moonlight and, and Sign, is it Sign Wife Symmetry? Sign Wave Symmetry. Sign Wave Symmetry, yeah. Rat Pack Interlude, Strim's Combat Engineers in Battle, The White Stalin of Ongiva, um, transition across the red line, those new school shoes, ballet, aerial ballet and napalm, two men, a dog and a field trial legend. Um, and then there's a poem called Anthem for a Doomed Youth with the First World War. Um, was there any one of these short stories that stood out for you or, or, or were they all special in their own way? Yes, the, the last one you mentioned, Anthem for a Doomed Youth, I didn't write that. That I just found somewhere, and I just found it very relevant. So that's not my own original work. All the others are my original work. And what I what I did there really was, um, uh, with a photographic memory, I, I take pictures in my head. And uh, instead of just uh, producing a photograph, I try to produce a, a photograph with words. So think of an artist that will work in oils, and they'll paint a, a, an image in oils. And there'll be a couple of imperfections on that. Well, that's what I do with words. Uh, so I simply write these stories. And each of those stories uh, tells something. It's a little snapshot moment. So you talk about that moon moon moonlight uh, and sine wave symmetry. That was an incident one night when uh, we were uh, in the operational uh, circumstances up in Angola. And we, would we were sleeping in our tank suits, our fireproof tank suits, sleeping in, uh, in our, in our uh, bags. Our boots on, etc., because we were in a, an operational situation, and uh, we'd sleep with our weapons in the sleeping bag. So I had my my personal nine millimeter parabellum pistol, uh, you know, just under my under my my my, my, my head here um, uh, on my chest. And uh, there was this rustle in the noise uh, in the night, and I heard the sound, and I cocked my weapon. I was I was ready to fire uh, because we didn't know what it was. But of course, it turned out to be a dog, a dog that had been abandoned. In war, and this poor dog had this emaciated look, and this uh, the tail, the long tail, and the sunken gut, and just it looked like a sine wave. And this was almost like a ghost moving across the uh, the landscape in the uh, moonlight because we used to operate during during full moon. 
Um, and uh, it just you know, struck me there was a metaphor there for the, for the, the, the tragedy of war where, where, where animals get abandoned. And I'm an animal lover, I'm a dog lover. So I just felt very deep compassion for this dog that was busy rummaging through the detritus of war. And for, I didn't shoot it, and you know, I'm very glad I didn't. Uh, but I just went back to sleep again. So there was just that that temporary moment, and you know, it was a short little, you know, like an image that I captured. But each of those stories, you know, that uh, Onjiva story that was at a hospital, uh, hospital in Onjiva where we went to give our some of our surplus uh, food we gave to uh, you know uh, the nursing staff at this hospital that was dealing under, under very difficult circumstances with casualties of war. So you know, we just we broke out of the war for that little moment in time, and we and we just showed some humanity, you know. So there's these little things, you know, the little little you know, issues like that. Uh, none of them particularly stand out, but um, um, that one about the the baobab, that, that that one stands out. Uh, in fact, that that has been that is a poem, and that's been turned into a, a song as we speak. That's been put to music. Did you at any point in this process of downloading your mind or your brain as you said did you get any writer's block in the process or did it or did it just all flow no i um i generally don't get writer's block when i'm writing something original where i do get writer's block is if i've been given a commission to write something or some technical paper and it's got to be ready by a certain date and certain time in a certain format so i'm not a, i'm not really a conventional person and uh if it's free flowing i just write so that book uh, shaking hands with Billy, I wrote that only on Saturdays over one year. So 52 Saturdays, that's the time it took me to write the book. And I sat down on day one and I wrote chapter one and day two I wrote chapter two. And so they just flowed. And then I spent a little bit of time in between, uh, maybe maybe cross-checking some of the dates, etc. And also polishing up and, you know, cleaning up, etc. But in general, I would write the chapter maybe, uh, maybe uh, I, I like to write the thing from start to finish in one go. So it's, it's, it, it flows. And that's why you also find that each chapter is maybe slightly different in style, etc. You know, so it all depends on how I felt at that particular moment. I know because reading the book, you kind of I was trying to fit it into a genre of sorts. And and I couldn't. I found that particularly difficult because it's it's so varied, you know, your stories, um, although they're kind of interwoven, each one is unique. In its, in, in its own right. Yes, that, uh, that's true. That also posed a, a problem uh, when, uh, when, when the publisher put it together because they didn't know what genre it was. So, so the shape of the book and the size of the book is a bit of an unusual shape and size simply for that reason. So is it a coffee table book with images? Is it a book of short stories? Is it an autobiography? Is it a historic thing? Well, it's, it's all of the above and none of the above. So, so yeah, it is what it is. Uh, it's got quite a few photographs and because of that, uh, we had to choose uh, good quality paper, so glossy paper, which made it unfortunately a little bit heavy for, you know, for shipping purposes. But you know, the, I mean, I'm not a professional publisher and I don't understand these things. So with the 2020 vision of hindsight, we know about this now. Were there any particular scenes that you edited out of this book or was it a complete download according to your memory? Look, uh, I obviously had to edit out because I was dealing in some cases with things that the public was unaware of, things that were highly classified operations, like, for example, the uh, the, the decision to go and, uh, and, uh, and avenge the Pretoria car bomb. I was recruited out of the out of the military, out of the army, uh, where I served in a in, a, in an armoured uh, an armoured uh, combat unit. I was recruited from there into a special operations unit being run by national intelligence in the chief direct COVID operations. And that is a highly sensitive top secret unit, and in fact, it never existed on any official organogram. And the people that were recruited into that unit were all people that had distinguished themselves uh, um, under operational circumstances in either the army, the air force, or the police. And that unit was uh, was uh, entirely based on the Mossad experience uh, when it came to uh, tracking down the perpetrator of the um, of the massacre in Munich and also the capture of Adolf Eichmann. Uh, so the operation that we were given, we were given the task of tracking down and 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 and, and, and uh, capturing and bringing home to stand trial the the chief of staff of Mkonto Esizwe. Uh, which was the, the uh, armed wing of the uh, African National Congress. And the reason for this was that the Pretoria car bomb was detonated outside military intelligence headquarters in Pretoria, the capital city, with significant loss of life, and it was an act of terrorism. 
It was considered at that point in time to be an act of terrorism. And, uh, uh, you know, that's part of what the book tries to deal with, this awkward history where, where nowadays it's no longer politically correct to talk about us, you know, being, a, being uh, uh, serving in an anti-terrorist unit because uh, the people that we were fighting are now the government of the day and they don't consider themselves to be terrorists, they consider themselves to be freedom fighters. So the whole thing about one man's freedom fighters and another man's terrorists is a very important sub-theme, if you like, in the book. And I try and deal with that because uh, there's uh, this new narrative that's come out now about good and bad and evil and ugly and, and you know, who, who's, who, who's right and who's wrong. And unfortunately, uh, people like myself that served with uh, hopefully dignity and integrity, uh, our stories have either been drowned out or they've been lost in this new narrative now about the glorious struggle that has resulted in, in, in what we have in South Africa today. And I just think that it's time to maybe look each other in the eye and uh, you know, be honest uh, with each other and, and tell the story with, uh, with you know, the most uh, integrity that one can tell. So it's a little piece of a story because no one's got one story. Everyone's got their own personal story. And each story is part of a great big tapestry. So I like to think of this as, the, as, the, as, 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 as a tapestry where the warp and the weft threads in a tapestry all come together in some way. And every one of those intersections of a warp and a weft is something. It's an incident. So, for example, my little short story about that, those new school shoes. You know, that was during a combat patrol where a little girl had just, you know, had, uh, had got a new pair of shoes on and uh, she was terribly proud of those shoes. And uh, that little moment captured in time, unless, unless I wrote that story, that little thing would be lost forever. That, that was a little walk and wet thread intersection at that moment in time, relevant at that moment in time and no longer relevant now. So, I, you know, it's kind of like, a, it's a therapeutic in a way because, uh, um, a lot of a lot of our veterans have dealt with very severe post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. I'm no exception. I've dealt with it to the best of my ability. I've dealt with it in secrecy and in private. And I'm now increasingly starting to come forward and talking about it uh, because I just think it's very important that we should show leadership uh, and empathy with people that have been in those circumstances. So a lot, a lot of stuff that I've said, you know, but it, you know, it's all sort of tied into that wonderful uh, book. Do you see yourself retiring as an author? Well, I'm very, uh, firstly, I'm a 12th generation African, and I'm uh, the, uh, the, the custodian of my family, of our, of our family history. So 12 generations uh, is, is quite a long time. And um, my oldest relative came out to South Africa with Jan van Riebeck. So in the context of the current discourse in South Africa about the fact that white people have stolen land and must give it back to the indigenous people, that's very interesting because uh, my family for 12 generations has, has co-evolved with that very same discourse. And uh, in almost every generation, there's been murder, there's been violence. That's why in my book, in the opening chapter, I, I, I refer to the fact that my personality was forged on the anvil of Africa by the hammer of endemic violence. So uh, as I approach retirement now, I've, I'm custodian of all of these rich little stories like, for example, my oldest relative came out as a refugee from the Thirty Years' War. He was born into the Thirty Years' War like I was, born into a, a situation of conflict, grew up in conflict, became a soldier in the conflict. His village was raised to the ground, lost everything, became a refugee, and then eventually uh, volunteered his service for the Dutch East India Company uh, as a security guy, uh, as a gunner, and he came out to South Africa and eventually was murdered in front of the Cape Town Castle when it was being constructed. So that's a little story now that... Is that story relevant only to me as a person? Is it relevant to our greater history? Is it just a story that's worthy of being captured? I don't know. But, uh, uh, you know, there are many stories like that because uh, there's a whole generation of women that came out to South Africa, at least eight women in my direct lineage, all of whom came to South Africa as, as uh, um, orphans. They all came under very difficult circumstances, uh, enduring a three-month, three-and-a-half-month voyage amongst men, uh, twice their age, three times their age, uh, without flushing toilets on a, on a, on a, on a ship, etc. And as they came to, uh, to, to South Africa, the then uh, Cape, literally as they stepped on shore, they were grabbed by men. And they were then, they were then uh, forced into marriage. And in some cases, the marriage is almost a slave-like marriage. And every one of those women have got a story. And one of those stories is linked today, believe it or not, to the importation of a genetic disorder in South Africa called porphyria. That is also linked wow. to the same, the same porphyria story in, in Western Australia. And, and, the, and the story is so dramatic because this, this young girl, when she was 18, that came to South Africa, her young brother uh, was, was unable to find access to an orphanage 
in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. And therefore, he survived by stealing and, by, and he was caught stealing and he was sent to Batavia you know, as a thief. And on the way to Batavia, he shipped with son and he carried the gene and he survived. But no doubt, only 10 years ago did they find out in, in, in Western Australia that he survived. He carried the gene and he you know, washed up on the, uh, on the shore as a sailor or as a, as a, as a, well, as a, as a prisoner on a ship. And he eventually integrated with the Aboriginal people. So the porphyria gene in the Aboriginal population comes from him. So there's a story there. Every one of these are stories. Now, I don't know how to tell the story. All I can do when I retire is I'm going to just sit down and, and put the facts together and tell each story as I know how, and then see if these are all little short stories in their own right or how they think. I don't know. I mean, this is a journey into the unknown, and I think it's a fascinating journey. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. listening to you now reminds me of a, of a lady I must introduce you to at some point. Um, she's called Valerie Woodgager. She's in the UK, um, a great grandmother. And she started on this mission a couple of years ago of getting people to tell their story. And she's showing how important, uh, and I mean, you'll appreciate this as a grandfather yourself. Um, she's on this mission to help people see how important storytelling is and why there is the importance of between grandparents and 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 um, and their grandchildren are, because the grandparents are the one that pass down the stories to their grandchildren, and that's how history is recorded through storytelling. Um, and so she's founded this this nonprofit called Learn with Grandma. But I mean, it it could be either of the grandparents. But the idea is that that storytelling happens via the grand grandparents throughout the generations and we must not permit that to die out. Yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, I can completely relate to that because uh, as a small boy, uh, I grew up in, in uh, difficult circumstances. My family were very, very poor and uh, I didn't understand how or why this had happened. And uh, my father was a very good hunter. He was an exceptionally good uh, uh, um, um, a man with a gun, and um, uh, he was, uh, if I had to draw a uh, parallel, he was probably like Wild Bill Hickok or Annie Oakley was in the, in the Wild West, in the sense that wherever he looked, uh, he didn't have to aim, he would just be able to fire a shot very accurately at the point that he looked. So, for example, as a small boy, he would think of nothing of taking me out of school, and I spent a long time on the, uh, on the plains of Kalahari. Um, sleeping under this infinite sky, the sky with millions and millions and millions of stars. You know. And it was there that I realized I'm, as an individual, I'm an utterly insignificant person. I'm simply, I'm simply like a grain of sand on the desert. That's what I am. Okay? But then I realized in that circle of light with these men talking, that's where I heard the stories that the reason why my father was so poor was that because during the Anglo-Boer War, the British scorched earth policy had left my, my grandparents destitute. But because they were destitute, they lived as squatters. They lived as they lived as tenant farmers. They lived. They eked out a pitiful existence on the edge of society. Now that narrative is not is not known in contemporary South Africa. But it was there under the Kalahari that at the age of eight, ten years of age, I realised that I am an insignificant person, but I'm not unimportant. You know, my my, 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 my significance is is derived from being part of a greater whole. And and so as an individual, I'm I'm irrelevant. You can you can snuff me out tomorrow. And that's it. No one's going to bat an eye. But if I'm part of something bigger, this is this is where this is where relevance comes from. And I learned that at a very young age. And I've and I've you know this is an important part of of, of, of the story of South Africa because uh, you know no one realizes that, for example, uh, you know there were there was a whole uh, group of South Africans, white South Africans, that were that were destitute after the Boer War. And because of that, that my, my grandfather was poor. Therefore, my father couldn't go to proper school. Therefore, my father grew up in Zululand, speaking Zulu as a mother tongue, but only with a rudimentary education. You know, my father was not an educated man. And only when the Sharpful massacre happened, and he was in a mass exodus of people from South Africa, and a loss of confidence in our economy, only then could my father afford to buy a piece of land for the first time. And from that, whole knowledge of ownership of land, what ownership of land means, because you can now take that, the title to that land, and you can raise capital from a bank. So, I mean, this is a story that I intimately understand. And it's the same story that's playing out now in broad South Africa. And, and yet, you know, the, 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 how do we get that story out? How do, we, how do we make sense of that in a way that, is, that gives hope to people, or in a way that, uh, that, that helps us to understand that 
that, that everything we're feeling today is nothing more than a, than a repetition of something that's happened before in the past. So what can we learn from that? Or in fact, one of the one of the short little poems that I wrote, a tiny little poem, which I thought was totally insignificant at the time when I was uh, I was up in Rwanda after the Rwandan genocide, and uh, I, I wrote a little poem. You know, what is the story of this land from where people fled so fast? What enduring mystery can be found in the swirling mists of the past? Are we doomed in cycles blind and no shade that peace can cost? Now, I consider that little that little uh, thing to be quite insignificant and quite unimportant. And I, uh, I almost embarrassed uh, to sort of uh, to, to, to include that in my book. But a music uh, 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 teacher, a music expert saw this and has put that to music now. And, and it's one of the most beautiful songs. And, 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 what is the story of this land? You know, just, just, it's, it's a lovely, lovely little song, okay? And uh, I have no idea of that. So, so how do we learn? Are we doomed in cycles blind? Uh, are we doomed to repeat the past, you know? Uh, surely, in fact, in fact, one of my other poems that I wrote on the, on, on the battlefield, um, uh, about a crew commander's lament, uh, where, as a crew commander, I was giving these orders, you know, to, to fire and, and, and what have you. And it's a, it's a very, uh, very uh, intimate place there that the soldier occupies. But in that poem, you'll see there, you know, they are also refer, uh, while on the field of battle, I'm talking about the fact, is there no chance of peace, you know? Why can't we find peace? Why is it that we are in this conflict situation where, where orders that we are giving now are literally stripping the flesh, the flesh off the bones of some, of some mother's son? And surely we must feel some sense of compassion for that. So my problem as a soldier, I was a thinking soldier. And a thinking soldier is not necessarily a good soldier because a good soldier is one that, one that you know, yours is not to do, yours is not to express in why yours is about to do or die. And I was always a thinking soldier. That's why I think I did very well in special operations later on when, uh, when, when we were required to think, where we were working in small teams, deep penetration operations, for long duration without any support from home, where you had to think, you had to solve your own complex problems, and that just suited me perfectly. So yeah, so it's all a journey, and you know? it's a journey of life. And uh, I still feel I've got something in me that I can offer, but I also feel that I'm getting to a point in my life now where, where I'm, uh, you know, I want to, I want to just relax a little bit, and I want to reflect a bit more on, on where we've come from and where we're going to go. And uh, if there, anyone's interested in anything that I've got to say, I'm more than willing to reach out to them. But I find it very therapeutic to write the right poems, the right, the right uh, words. And the poems might not be perfect because they reflect an imperfect life and they reflect an imperfect world. You know, I've read yeah. some of your, your poems um, and they are amazing. Do you think you'll put together a collection at some point? I participated with a, a, a very uh, well-known uh, South African soldier, uh, Lieutenant Colonel David Lotta who's, uh, in my view, one of the one of the top bush war writers in South Africa. He was at a very young age uh, 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 in a, a commanding officer situation in a, in a combat team and eventually in a battle group. Um, so he carried, us, uh, as the, as the, with the rank of major, he carried the responsibilities of, of a brigadier. So, you know, amazing, amazing responsibilities on the shoulders of a young man. And, and, and uh, today he is, in my view, one of the most prolific writers. And he brought out a book called, uh, called Noob's Belly. It was an anthology of, of, war, of war poems. And he reached out to all the South African uh, veterans and asked anyone that wanted to write poems you know, to put it out there. So I have got some of my work in, uh, in Noob's Belly. And, uh, and uh, you know, one of the, the poems that I liked the most uh, was this one particular poem. I can just quickly recite a little bit, uh, if, if, if I might. Uh, with his word, pictures. When we were operating up in up in Angola, it's a very parched landscape. It's a very uh, it's a landscape that in, in is in many places featureless. It's got no mountains except in the east of the country. Sorry, in the, in the in the west of the country you've got mountains, but in the eastern part there are no mountains. It's flat, featureless, and you've got the subterranean flow of water, which I happen to know quite a bit about. And uh, in that flat, featureless landscape, you get uh, you get certain things that. Uh, that are manifested. So I try to capture those things, and uh, if I can just re remember the poem, I'll just quickly give you the first part of it. It's um, uh, on a parched and distant uh, uh, um, savannah where the dust devils roam. There once was a mobile fighting force that made this place their home. Young boys, not yet men, stared at death in the eye as the insane screech of shrapnel rained down from the steel blue sky. In shallow foxholes they slept as the migs hunted up high striking with deadly intent in the veritable blink of an eye. 
The commanders were burdened by the precious lives in their care. Advance at their speed, and by the sun they must spare. But when hot steel cleaves soft flesh, and the great glutton starts to feed, the decisions they make uh, 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 advise their advance at their speed. Your energy, kinetic, strikes in a, crash, in a flash, carbonizing life, uh, um, uh, smashing steel, survivors with vacant eyes stare, stunned, alive, unable to feel. Um, hell on earth with a vengeance unleashed, uh, shot out tanks saw a crackle and a flame, wheels crush life from soft flesh, death by whatever means is the same. The job that was done by that mobile armored fighting force, but fierce but not much fun along that great meandering watercourse. So, so this is, you know, that was an image that just happened at that moment in time. And each of those words I've chosen carefully because they all represent something that happened within. Uh, so, you know, things like that I find cathartic. I try to dignify the process, try to capture the moment in time. I try and download my head and I try and make myself feel a little bit, a little bit better. And the good news is that I think uh, when a soldier stops to feel compassion, they get completely lost. And that's when they go beyond what I call that thin gray line, dehumanize lost souls. What is there? Why is there yearning simply to be free? They're invoking us that thing called fear. Is there no place in there somewhere or for me? What will it take for us to seek between us common ground? Or does the beat of Mother Africa's heart do us eternal? No shade that peace can find. So these are, you know, these are little bits and pieces of different things that I've written, and they all, I think, they they they, they capture, they capture the uh, the moment, but they capture the fact or the need for us to reconcile, and we can only reconcile as a nation if we can first reconcile with ourselves. Each person has to look at themselves in the mirror, and each 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 combat soldier has to has to acknowledge that I'm still a human being, and even though I've been asked to do to do dehumanize things on behalf of society, that very same society that today rejects us, that very same society that today has, is not interested in, in our plight or our woes because we are, we, are, we are the lost generation. We are the people that answered the call and did what had to be done. We did the heavy lifting for society. So, so in all of this, it's a very complicated porridge, porridge of emotions and porridge of facts and things. And I just think that it's important that we should, uh, we should raise the issue. And I'm very grateful people like yourself now that give us a platform to actually raise these uh, these points. The important thing is that soldier to soldier, veteran to veteran, combatant to combatant, I've seen time and time again there is more uniting former enemies than there are uniting that same combat soldier and the rest of the members of his own society. And this is the remarkable thing that as we speak here today, we've got a, a very resilient relationship with the Russians, for example, South Africans and Russians, former enemies, South Africans and Angolans, former enemies, South Africans and Swapo, former enemies. Uh, we haven't quite got a relationship with the Cubans yet. They're not interested in talking to us. And we don't, unfortunately, have a good relationship with our own, our own liberation movement people in South Africa. They don't want to talk to us. So this is something that, as veterans, we've just got to get out there and we've got to carry the flag and we've got to bring the, the, bring the, 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 the message of hope and respect and integrity and reach out constantly across that great world. In closing, can I ask you very quickly, shaking hands with, with Billy without giving away too much to the to the readers, who is Billy? Um, Billy was the chief of staff of Nkunto and he was the uh, he was Billy was the code name of the uh, person that we had to track down and the mission that we had in the unit called K43 that I served in, special operations unit that was that was made up of hand-selected people from different for uh, different services, um, Army, Navy, Army, Air Force, and, uh, and, and, and police. And uh, we had to track him down, and we had to then decide on at what moment can we capture him and bring him home safely. And at the moment that we could capture him, we had to send a signal back to Victoria saying we can shake hands with Billy. And that, that would then trigger the next phase of the operation, which was the capture phase. I was in the reconnaissance phase doing the early close in reconnaissance of the target in order to, to determine when and where we could capture him, and then that signal would, would trigger the next phase. And that whole thing became a metaphor for our subsequent uh, uh, deep uh, uh, secret behind the scenes reaching out to the liberation movement uh, in, a, in an attempt to try and open up a back channel communication so that we could have a negotiated transition 
to peace in South Africa. The Shaq Nancho Belly for me is a metaphor actually for for Kadesa, for the uh, for the negotiated transition we had in South Africa. And, and let me just say in closing, South Africa is a remarkable country, and I'm very very proud to be a veteran of South Africa. And let me just just give you my little my little uh, a few words here. South Africa is the only country in the world where a prisoner of conscience looked at his jailer and realized that his jailer was as much in need of liberation as he was. That is remarkable. South Africa is the only country in the world where we had an army, largely of conscripts, that was nuclear capable with a sophisticated chemical, biological uh, warfare capability, not dissimilar to present-day Iraq, not dissimilar, uh, sorry, present-day Iran, not dissimilar to present-day uh, North Korea. We were there. We, we were nuclear capable, okay? And we dismantled those things voluntarily. We became the only country in the world that has voluntarily relinqu relinquished sophisticated weapons system, okay? And we, we, we are the only uh, country in the world where we, a sitting government, negotiated itself out of power in the best interest of society at large, realizing that if it continued to do what it's going to do, it would result in a civil war of such cataclysmic proportions that the, the earth would be so scorched there would be nothing left for anybody. That is remarkable. And then we're the only society in South Africa that has had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission where former enemies, where, where, where a perpetrator and a victim could come together, eyeball to eyeball, and say, I'm sorry, this is what I did, and I regret what I did. I think all of those things are remarkable. I think mean, collectively that makes South Africa a remarkable place. And that's the sort of, that's the, that's the ethos, that's the spirit that I've tried to capture in the book. It's, I mean, it's, a, it's a humble book. It's not a book about how we blew things up and how we did incredibly heroic. It's not that at all. It shows that in this carnage, in, this, in, this, in that moment in time where people are scared, people are afraid, people are doing terrible things to each other, but there's always got to be this hope. So that's what it's all about. It's a humble book that help, helps us to contextualize and hopefully dignify the, 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 the destruction and the loss of lives that we've lived through as a nation. And unless we do something about that now, unless we reconcile properly, I'm afraid, doomed in cycles, blind, no, no shade that peace can find. That's going to happen. The next generation and the next generation is going to go through the same thing. So that's my, that's my sort of humble uh, uh, you know, call to people. To just you know, let's 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 look at each other honestly. In Zulu, they say a from Klopi. I can talk to you honestly because I can look into the white of your eyes. Now let's do that. Let's do that. And let's let's move on. Anthony, thank you. This has been amazing um, time with you. I really enjoyed this. I want to just ask you in closing. Before we close, we we briefly touched. Um, on you being involved in a project with Water Shortage South Africa and the Water Lines. Can you just very briefly, in closing, tell um, our audience what that's about? And yes, I'm, asking, uh, I'm asking simply because of your relationship with with water. Yes, okay. okay. Uh, very briefly, as a young boy growing up in the Kalahari, I realized in the desert that water is important. I later realized that water in the Kalahari is, in fact, nothing more than the same water that comes from the Okavango, which is a unique oasis in the world. It's a river that doesn't flow into the ocean, flows into a desert. And I became an expert on the Kalahari uh, and an expert on the, uh, on the Okavango. So the whole thing about water moving through a landscape and the livelihoods that it brings, but more importantly, water as a weapon of war or water also as a tool for deepening democracy or building society. And I've done a lot of work in the Islamic world and I found what's interesting in the Islam is that water has got as very, water is a gift from Allah. And because water is a gift from Allah, you may not withhold water from another person. So in the front of, in the house of, of any devout Muslim in the Middle East, you'll see a big jar, a big, a big clay jar of water. And anyone can walk up in the, in the streets and actually take water from that. So water is, a, is to me is a, is a very important part of, uh, of peace building, of nation building, and it's the one thing that can unite us when everything else can divide us. And the whole idea of the Water Lines project is that because we've seen a breakdown of the rule of, of law in South Africa, we've seen one, one set of laws for, for politically connected people and another set of laws for, for, for ordinary people, uh, and as a result, our water sector is failing. Uh, so the Water Lines project is designed to restore law and order, not, not as a vigilante group, but simply 
to, to, to invoke whatever legal instruments you can to hold people accountable. And the, and the term of bringing down a buffalo is from my experience in the Okavango, where there's a pride of lions that, uh, there that has solved the problem of how to hunt big buffalo and elephant. And they do it in a very specific way. And that's how we're going to do it. We're going to we're going to be, we're going to hold people accountable. That's what the metaphor bring bring down the buffalo. That that simply means we we society, the ordinary people, the ordinary Joe Blows that are not important, that have got no no authority. We are going to hold our elected officials accountable because that was the promise of our young democracy. That is the promise that was that was paid for by blood by thousands of South African veterans on both sides of the divide. That's, a, that's the long and the short of it. Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And the links are in the comments. Um, where can people buy a copy of Shaking Hands with Billy? I wish that Amazon would carry it. So if people had to ask Amazon, maybe Amazon will carry it, but at the moment they don't. Um, the, the best way to do it is to simply uh, uh, click on the uh, Shaking Hands with Billy website. And at the top there, there's a, it takes you to a link to a, a war books. All of the proceeds, proceeds that go to that particular place go to a charity for war veterans. I don't make any money out of that sale at all. But if there is, uh, if people can't come right there, then they're welcome to just drop me an email and give me their address and, you know, we, we can sort it out that way. It'll be a bit, bit slow, but a bit, a bit more cumbersome. But if a big bookstore would consider taking it on, I would be grateful. And, uh, you know, but that, uh, I've never managed to get that sorted out. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you, um, your, your time and sharing your story with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.